that'll be one of your actions when you get back to your office is grab a copy of Dancing the Ceiling. It is an amazing book and it is my pleasure to introduce Angel Henry. Ah, oh, thank you, Jeff. It was March 26, 1948. Charles Wade and Lavora Odin were wed. It was just the four of them, well, five, if you include the pastor. It was Lavora and Charles's Aunt Rose, Charles and his brother Calvin. Charles and Lavora had met just two years prior at Kentucky State University in Frankfort, Kentucky. Lavora got there because in her family, her father, affectionately known as Big Daddy, said that girls could only get two years of learning. That's all that they were allowed. Then they had to go off and start their families. Charles had got to Kentucky State through a football scholarship. Well, they met and fell in love. Only problem is, Lavora had to leave. She finished her sophomore year and back home to Kentucky, she had to go. Charles is thinking, I can't let the love of my life get away. So right in the middle of his senior year, he quits and he goes down further into Kentucky and gets her, brings her up north to where he and his Aunt Rose were staying. Aunt Rose extended her home to them, to the newlyweds. And as they sat there that night, the first night of their marriage, they sat contemplating, where do we go? Where do we start our family? See, there was pressure, right? Lavora had her two years of learning. She had to get going. She was ready to start her family that night. Charles was thinking, how am I going to provide? I'm essentially a college dropout. But the world was their oyster, right? I mean, they could go anywhere. Heck, they could even go back home to their roots where their, where their family was from, you know, Georgia and Alabama. Oh, but wait. Charles and Lavora are African-American. Going back home was not an option. Why? Their families were part of what we call in the United States, the Great Migration. Charles's family hailed from D, Georgia. They had migrated all the way up to Northeast Ohio. You know, think Cleveland, Youngstown, Akron, that area. Why did they go all the way from Georgia to Ohio? Well, for jobs, of course. <laughs> Hell no. It was to escape the lynchings. It was for survival, poverty, unequal education, the KKK beating down your door, your neighbors with crosses burning on their lawn. Yeah, but we'll go ahead and say it was for the jobs. Lavora's family was from deep Alabama. Going back there was an absolute no. Her father, you know, good old big daddy, he moved from Alabama to Kentucky to work in the coal mines. In fact, Big Daddy lived to be over 100 years old. He survived those coal mines and got an award. I think it was just because he didn't get black lung. Charles and Lavora did achieve the American dream. They ended up with their house, their two dogs, and their white picket fence, and the five kids that Lavora so desperately wanted. Four girls, uh, four boys and a girl, my mom. They achieved that because Charles decided to be a bricklayer. He joined Whitaker Greer Company in 1948, and he retired in 1995. I know because that was my junior year of college. Charles helped get me through college. Lavora went back to school, 
she wanted a little more than two years of learning and became a nurse. Four Navy men and my mom's a PhD. Look me up on LinkedIn, y'all. I got more degrees and certifications and letters behind my name than I've got in my name. All thanks to their sacrifice. All thanks to Charles making the decision to stay up north and becoming a bricklayer. It was the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. It was the industrial age of America. People were working with their hands. They were in coal mines. They were in brickyards. They were laying railroad. They were in the factories. So you might be thinking, Angel, that was a pretty cute origin story, but what the heck does that have to do with tech? Well, I am a big proponent of what? If we're going to predict the future, we have to look at past performance. And the past performance of the industrial age is a direct, I mean direct point for point illustration of what we are going through in the digital age right now. So what's tech's role in all this, right? We talked about the industrial revolution, the digital age. Well, tech, absolutely, smack dab in the digital age. That means that, oh my goodness, isn't this interesting? When Big Daddy was sitting there, back in, oh, I'm gonna say probably the early 1920s, looking at his bride saying, where am I gonna go for work, hon? They booked out of Alabama and went to Kentucky. When granddad looked at Lavora, he said, oh, where am I going to work, hon? And they booked it to the brickyard in Northeast Ohio. When my husband and I got married in 2005, we looked at each other. What are we going to do? We're going into tech. Because exactly what Jeff said. That's where the money was at. That's what they told me. They said, yeah, you can do marketing, HR, da, da, business, yeah. But if you major in computers, you can really make a life for yourself. And I wanted the American dream too, just like Big Daddy and Big Mama, just like Grandma Lavora, I wanted it as well. And tech was my vehicle to get there. Tech was my way out of being with a single mom in a two bedroom apartment to where I could have a condo in downtown Indianapolis overlooking the canal. I had my first car. I was paying off my student loan debt. I was jet setting around working for a consulting firm. I saw cities and met people. Tech was my way out, just like the coal mines, just like the brickyard. But what's it really like? being a black person working in tech. So what's it like? Well, I spent my pandemic year finding out. From November 2019 to December 2020, I interviewed approximately 30 to 32 African-American women, all in tech. That's it, no other sector, no other industry. Okay, or excuse me, different sectors, no other industry. So from the government to um, big six, uh, consulting firms to the small boutique, literally from Washington State to Florida. This is what they said. They're the only, my favorite is the 99.99% .99 of the time, I'm the only African American female. Okay, we get it, sister. You're it. Right? What does that feel like? It feels like being the token. But what does that really mean? That really means that the weight of your race and your gender is on your shoulders. The maid, the cleanup person, always the person doing the notes in the meeting, always the one setting up, always the one doing the fun stuff. Talked about, Mike's talked about fun. I am so freaking proud that Mike was the one doing the fun stuff on that team and that didn't get delegated to the only woman on the team or the only African American or the only underrepresented population. No, he took the initiative to do that. 
So those small little insignificant comments or things that are made, the jokes that are made, yet yeah, in the moment, in that time, it's, it's small, it's insignificant, it's something that could get passed by. But to the person who's receiving it, if they have those multiple times a day in every meeting on Zoom, that becomes an issue. Everybody raise your hand. Raise your hand high. On my honor. I promise not to ask and not to touch a black woman's hair. Thank you. Now that's on behalf of the picture right there in the corner. I know y'all are wondering about that. For those of you who can't see in the back, it's a picture of um, a lady's head that's a natural hairstyle, kind of curly, kind of fluffy, and it says, don't touch my hair. Now, where did I get that from? That is an actual screenshot of one of the women that I interviewed. She was telling me about an incident where she put that particular photo on her cube wall. She tacked that up. Origin story there. Well, she sent me a picture of her, of her cube and, the, and that actual photo. And her desk is kind of cat a corner. So her, um, she's facing this way and the cube wall opening is here. And uh, she's a younger uh, girl, I'm gonna say probably in her mid to late 20s. And she wears a lot of different hairstyles. Sometimes it's in braids, sometimes it's curly, sometimes it's straight, sometimes it's short, sometimes it's long, it's weave, whatever. She's got colors all, all the day. And it could be from week to week or day to day, depending on what she's got going on. That was just so fascinating to people. So fascinating so much that they would come and touch it. I will never understand the power and privilege that it takes to touch someone without their masking. But anyway, so it was happening. And the president of her unit walked by and said, oh, what's this? She explained. And he said, she said that he was like, okay, walked away. Let's come back. You are that president and you walk past someone who works in your department and you see that sign and you asked her, why is that sign up there? And she says, well, it's because I feel like a pet in a zoo. People are going by and petting me and I just wanted to stop. So I put the sign up there and it stopped. In that moment, you have position, you have power, and you have privilege to go deeper. And I'm so saddened for her. It breaks my heart that the president of her department said, I see you, I hear you, I validate your experience, keep the sign up, okay, goodbye. that you see and you validate and you shake your head and you say, I see what you're going through. I'm reading the quotes and nothing has changed. No strategic plan. It's not tied to your mission or vision. You're not looking at it regularly with metrics and measuring it. Didn't put a budget to it. And you see signs like that and you walk away. Intentionality is action. Revolving door. Back in 2008, we have a study that says half, over half of highly qualified women, not just one, highly qualified women in science, engineering, and technology have quit their jobs. This great resignation, hoo-ha, what is it, silently quitting? <laughs> just ignore that. It's been happening, it is happening, and it will continue to happen. So all of that money that you did to recruit from the HBCU, all of that time that you put into reviewing your job descriptions and making sure that they sound inclusive, all that work was great, but it's for not if you get us in and we are right back out less than five years later. 
And why? Why is that happening? Why are 41% of qualified scientists, engineers, and technologists that are women are stuck at that lower rung at the corporate ladder? The bro culture, the ping pong tables, the foosball, the gaming consoles. Everybody's playing, snickering and laughing. Y'all know y'all got them. <laughs> you know you got them. First day on my job, first damn day, three o'clock in the afternoon. I'll change his name. We'll call him, we'll call him Ben. Ben walks in with a big bottle of Jägermeister and a glass. Welcome to the team, Angel. Holy crap, I joined a frat house. <laughs> I'm not in software development. I'm at five eight a new. <sighs> people really okay so <laughs> essentially long story short proposed DNI solutions are not working Pamela Newkirk tells us all about it a billion dollars from the late 80s to now has been drained into training and unconscious bias and sexual harassment and how to build inclusive workforce and nothing has changed we just saw the stats why would I change a system that's working for me why would I change a system that is working for me? And lastly, follow me on LinkedIn. That's how you know you've got the right angel. You'll see that mugshot. Just go to L Angel Henry, and every Friday at 1230, we'll continue to unpack this because this is not a one and done. And quite frankly, I'm tired, y'all. I need help, and I need your help, okay? because I'm ready to break through that damn ceiling. I don't know about the rest of y'all. Thank you.